Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 668. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 11th, 2021. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, where two men sit down and talk about all the news Anglican, all the news Christian, and a lot of fun secular stuff, too. We just find stuff interesting when we talk about it. You listen. It, it, it's a working relationship. And we appreciate you being the audience that shows up here every week to listen to us. Before we get too far, the audience who shows up here and listen to us listens to us every week should like the program on facebook and youtube that's free advertising please share this program with your friends family and foe love your enemy yes share it with your foes as well and if you want to and many of you do go to the comment section and fill out the comments on the topic of the day we got lots of topics of the day once again for some reason we're going to the uk a lot of british news but that's okay that's anglican at least Anglican means of England, so it's it's okay to talk about British news. George, how's your week going? Been wonderful. Um, June and November are the months when the year-rounders in Florida travel. June for weddings and graduations, November for Thanksgiving. And that means my Thursday and Friday work crew, the guys who cut the grass and arrange the furniture, they're all gone. So I have been cutting <laughs> grass and I, we're a little late in filming this morning because I had to go home and take a shower because I had to set up the parish hall for a funeral to mark, for a funeral reception. But I'm clean and happy and excited and everything's done. All I need is the body and I'm ready to go for the funeral tomorrow. It is a much more solemn occasion, but George and I uh, do our pre-show and we're in a giddy mood. That's just the way it works here on Anglican Unscripted. On to the news. My first story is the Queen Goes Missing in Oxford. Uh, for those of you who have been watching anything from the BBC or international news, knows that some American student who is, is woke, that means he's a... A uh, person who thinks colonialism is the, the worst evil of all, and that the queen is a colonialist, obviously, and that she is a horrible individual and should not be pictured in his college, had a vote with the student council, and they, re they decided to remove her image. And I'm like, really? Queen Elizabeth? Of all the people you think is... <laughs> <laughs> the worst stetched evil out of England. It's it, it's Queen Elizabeth, George. I uh, I thought this would be a great way to start off Anglican Unscripted on Friday. Well, the junior, the middle common room at Magdalen College. Now, for those who who may not be familiar, Oxford University I think has thirty eight colleges, mm -hmm. which are the the institutions the students actually attend, plus some private halls. Um, Wycliffe Hall, the seminary, is one of the private halls of Oxford University, for instance. Maudlin is famous uh, for, well, that's where C.S. Lewis went, uh, mm -hmm. uh, was, a, uh, was a don, and it's a beautiful school, has its own deer park. And, and the Middle Commons Room is where the graduate student club or union. And I was once an Oxford student, member of my Middle Commons Room, and I went once and I never went back. This well, is where which, this which is where the which, which college did you go to at Oxford then? I was at Merton College. No, okay. A much better college than Magdalen College. Of course. Uh, but at uh, Magdalen, the uh, there's an American there's an American student who's president of the grad of the Middle Common Room. And they took a vote to remove the portrait of Queen Elizabeth from the MCR common room because the, he said that the sight of the Queen would basically trigger those students from former colonial possessions of Great Britain. So a Nigerian student or a South African student or a Burmese or an Indian student. Now, most of the planet once was under British control. So the... <laughs> So the uh, so to make people feel better about themselves, they took down the portrait of the queen. Now let me say, 
not every member of the graduate student body of Maudlin College took part. Those who are active in MCR politics are usually, though, if they're an American, they usually want to get a job with MSNBC when they get back to the U.S. It's, oh, it's the unspeakable uh, people that, you know, you just avoid it at all costs. Well, at least I did. Uh, and I have to say, I never saw him in chapel. My, when I was at Oxford, I was ordained, and therefore I was sort of half... I was neither fish nor fell. I was a graduate student, but I was also staff. I wasn't a fellow. And therefore, when they housed me, they put me on a little street, on a once, and they gave me a house. And on one side of me was the college butler, and on the other side was the college barman. Sort of, and I was sort of the equivalent of an NCO. I wasn't an officer, but I wasn't one of the uh, squaddies. And the, the college staff, were the kindest, most warm and generous, wonderful people. That's what made my time at Oxford. Not the other graduate students, not the uh, professors, but my real experience with, I hate to say it this way, but real Englishmen were with the butler and the cooks and the, uh, the porters, which are the men who stand guard at the gate. Now, the... Uh, Life of an Oxford college for a graduate student is of constant striving to impress your tutor, to impress other people, and to go back to the United States and be like Rachel Maddow. She went to Oxford and was roughly there at my time. And to go back and show how progressive and wonderful woke you are with just this sort of nonsense, absolute nonsense, that maybe one out of ten graduate students showed up to vote for. And let, let's just walk walk back a little bit here. There are trauma, plural, traumas that people can suffer in life. Whether you go to war, whether you are beaten by a spouse, whether you are in a car accident. There, there, there's things that your brain just can't comprehend or deal with. And when you revisit that trauma at times, you are triggered. Triggered is a real thing. When I see these woke individuals misusing the word triggered and misusing uh, a real medical condition that exists, you know, the, this wokeism has called, become wicked mm -hmm. because they're misusing the terms, they're redefining the terms. You and I know, having visited many countries within Africa, that the Africans love their queen. They love to meet Queen Elizabeth whenever there's an invitation to come as an archbishop or bishop to England. Does it include tea with a queen? You know, this young little American whiner uh, has misused the word trigger. He's misused uh, mental illness to get his way to remove the image of the queen from a college at Oxford. And, uh, it, it, and it he's a guest me. in Britain. He's a guest. And he's just being a jackass. Um, and I hate to say it, but there are, there are a lot of professional students who are total jackasses. Yeah. Mommy or the government is paying the way, so they don't really have any consequences for their stupidity. No, um, and they won't. They won't see, you know, any kind of, he will not see any consequences at all. In fact, when he gets back to America, I guarantee there is a certain ex-royal couple who now live in California, who just had a baby, who will probably entertain this young individual uh, for the weekend, and that will make press. At, I think the thing is, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, the late Prince Philip, have probably been the most successful monarchs of Britain since, I don't know, successful in the sense of winning the affection and endearment of the people. Remember, Prince Philip is a prince of Greece and Denmark. He's, he, ha, he was, Greek ortho, was Greek Orthodox and yeah. uh, he had foreign citizenship. His, he came to Britain after his father was uh, dethroned from the Greek uh, royal kicked out of Greece by the by a coup and yet Prince Philip is in money maids an embodiment of the best of British gentlemanly manners and Elizabeth is not Queen Elizabeth is not worshipped because she is such a cutting wit or she has such a fine brain 
but she has given 70, 75 years, maybe, of uninterrupted service, selfless service, mm -hmm. to her country and her people. And you can, you can trust these these professional students, these professional whiners who will go on to the work in the media or in the law or in high finance or something. And what do they give back to their country? Well, they go into towns and they raid uh, manufacturing firms, strip the assets, sell them off, move the machines to China. Uh, they, they're the predator class. The, 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 uh, the, the bad people in the movie Wall Street. Yes. Yes. And, and you contrast that with the selfless service that you saw that you saw in Prince Philip, that you see in the Queen, that you see in Princess Anne, uh, even Prince Charles and the future King William. Really, there's an exceptional quality about these people that really are not matched by any other royal family I know. Well, I don't no, know many royal families, but... Well, uh, I know, I, I would say they are probably the most famous and most successful royal family in the history of mankind. Well, uh, there, there, I can't think of any others. Well, there is. Or in King terms Kong. of success, there might be the Japanese royal family has been the same family in place the longest. Right. But but they're having a crisis right now. They are having a big crisis. They're bad having a kids. Big, uh, bad kids. And one of the kids is marrying a Christian and is going to become a Christian. Mm -hmm. And this is their Meghan Markle moment. Uh, are we going to have a Japanese? Now, the commoners have been marrying into the royal family now for one, two generations. So she's a Japanese commoner. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not from the Japanese nobility, but she's also Christian. And she met her husband, uh, no, sorry, he, the boy is the commoner. The girl is right. the princess. That, and she is rumored to be about and the japanese royal family is having a conniption fit the way the japanese do meaning we don't know a thing about it we just hear rumors uh because they don't express their what they're saying uh, thinking in public well we reported last week about uh the william taylor affair and you know the continued response to jonathan fletcher the continued response to jonathan smythe and we got emails explaining well you know England is just different. You we you don't get it. You don't, you don't get, get it. it. You don't. England is different, and I know it's different. I rented a car in England. You are different. Wrong side of the. <laughs> I rented a car with manual transmission in England, so I had my stick shift on my left hand. The clutch is all screwed. It just it was re very difficult to drive on the left side of the road with a left-handed manual transmission. I remember that was a. That was a diesel Skoda, too. Yes. I mean, a was... diesel manual uh, transmission with the steering wheel on the wrong side. And I I remember you driving, and I thought I was going to die. Yeah. Because you well, forget, at, you know, now, are, where are we? Are we in England, or are we in the continent? I mean. So bad. And so England is different. And that's a, that's a, a polite word I'm using right now. But England, as Gavin and I and you had talked before, has a caste education system. You are educated based on where you and your family are economically in society. And the good students of an economical uh, background go to one set of schools. The rest go to the public schools. And that is your future. And the kids go to school knowing that that is their future. I am, because I'm going to this type of school, going to be a blue collar worker all my life. Because I'm going to a more privileged school, I'm going to be a banker or an oil tycoon or an insurance person because this little caste system exists and where I go to school does really protect my future in England. You know, you went to Oxford. And so it is different. And there's also differences with how the working class public education people uh, deal with their social problems or uh, confrontations than a upper class private school person was. And we were told, you know, you know, one of the problems with William Taylor and the John Smythe and the Fletchers is they were of a different caste 
And in that type of caste system, they were allowed to be more abusive, authoritative, corporal punishment than you would ever find in a public education system. I've had several letters on this point, both from ex-public school boys and from people of a working class background. Um, we were in England for many a uh, number of years, and our children were born in the United States uh, w when I was at Yale, and then for their first few years, we were in Oxford, and they attended the uh, or uh, the Oriel College uh, nursery, uh, which met in the uh, cricket pavilion of Oriel College. Uh, I'm sorry, Balliol College. And so Laura and Claudia, like you know, at one time said, "Where to go to school? We go to Balliol College." When they were four years old. Well, the time came for them to start school, and I was the assistant chaplain at my college. That's when I said well, I was neither fish nor fowl. I was a student, plus I was also staff as an assistant chaplain. And the senior chaplain, uh, the, the chaplain who was a fellow, Mark, Mark uh, said to me, now, if you're going to, you, you know, you can stay another few years if you'd like, finishing your degree, but you need to put your children in school. And here's how you choose the right school. You go and you meet the teacher and listen to her accent. And if the accent is an accent that you want your children to have, that is where you go. And here is what I, where I recommend you to go so that your children are educated properly. And essentially, the, these were the code words of saying, this is how the class system works and starts, and uh, you would send your child to this and this only, this school for little girls in Oxford. Um, Susan and I chose to move back to the United States instead, and I, my life took a different course, and I lost interest in academia. I basically thought it was a waste of my time because I really wanted to be a priest, not not a pontificator. That's what I do when I go to script it. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're a pontificator at the altar. <laughs> but, yes. but some of the comments we've received are very well put, that uh, it was pointed out to me that uh, William Taylor went to Eton, then to Cambridge. He was in the Army for five years, and he is a certain type and in that class structure in england corporal punishment and abuse uh was commonplace and the thought that you would complain about such abuse would be absolutely foreign to your mindset now my response was i sort of went to the parallel in the united states of the same sort of, I went away to school when I was 13. I went off to colleges and did all this and that. I followed the same path without being a professional soldier. Uh, I went to Wall Street instead. Well, you, you, went, the, to, the, you the, went to a private boarding school. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, I, I did public schools even through college. And so, you know, we took different, different systems. But it, the, in the caste system in America the class system here there's no abuse there's no abuse and the very thought that if abuse took place would be and you know we read about the abuse in the catholic school system and occasionally you'll read about an abuse incident in the in private schools mm -hmm. but the point is the catholic world was a different world uh we did not look at our you know there are always episcopal priests in my private schools. I went to Episcopal Academy, then I went to boarding school. They were not held or treated the same way that a Catholic priest is. Um, they weren't magic human beings. Mm -hmm. And if somebody did something to you that was untoward, if you didn't speak up, that was the problem. That was the issue. Perhaps it has to do with sort of the John Wayne American uh, frontier mentality that cuts across class lines and education lines and geographic lines you just don't put up with that crap whereas in the equivalent slice of english life to mine in american life that would be normal and that again i don't get it because i didn't live through that well john wayne would have never driven on the left side of the road <laughs> okay, let's be honest here. <laughs> it's a different system. And so we don't get it, but you know, we want our audience to know that, you know, this has been the response from many of our viewers is it is different. It is a class system, but it's also a caste system. You're cast into this. 
because uh, you will stay in this system uh, until death. And you know, we find it in India, you find it in England, the UK as well. So, One, one yeah. of the things that my, uh, people sometimes say, where, where are you from? Where's your accent from? And I respond, I don't have an accent because everybody talks like I do. My wife talks like I do. My father, my brothers and everything. I sort of came, one of the, the bo this boys' school I went to had 600 boys from across the United States and some foreigners. And you had boys from Texas and the Deep South and from Boston. And when we all got there at 13, 14, 15 years of age, we couldn't understand each other. Um, like, I couldn't understand this one guy on my hall who came from uh, just north of Boston. He had such a thick accent. And what we were you trained to find the door. Where's the door? Go park the car in the half <laughs> yard. You know, it was. Well, the point is, part of the thing that these schools taught was a standardized American English, so that you sound like a newscaster or a radio announcer. You have a neutral accent, and but it wasn't class based. It just was sort of taking the geographic diversity. Uh, so that I did, I don't have a Philadelphia accent. I have what I have. Mm. It, you know, I uh, William F. Buckley type accent was what they taught you to speak proper standard American English. Um, now that I don't think they do anymore because that's uh, not as valued by parents these days. But again, there are similarities, and then there are such major differences between our system and the British system um, that it really is, sometimes it is foolish for us to comment on English things because we do not get it sometimes. <laughs> Which is good. Okay, not understanding society, the, you know, the broken part of society is, is fine. Um, I hope uh, finer heads prevail here that they put the, the portrait of the Queen back up in this hall that uh, the students will, you know. Well, I, I, I know. I, I, I tell you what's going to happen. Okay. With they're about to go on the long summer vacation, so the staff are the ones who actually do the work in British co in Oxford the colleges. Yeah. So they will ask the staff to remove the portrait. The staff won't do it. Summer vacation comes back in the fall. And they'll have a new commons room, and somebody will suggest, well, "Why don't we rethink our actions?" So unless the commons room is going to put a chair up under the uh, portrait and have somebody climb up and take it down, the staff aren't going to do it. The staff won't do it, but we've seen Americans ripping down uh, statutes and uh, portraits here in America with no problem of uh, the Civil War and Revolutionary War and things that triggered them. I would not be surprised to see a student do it there. I just, you, you think it would be a higher class place, not when you let an American in. <laughs> you well, ruined there's it. A, there's a strike going on right now. 160 lecturers at Oxford University yeah. and uh, instructors refuse now to teach classes in the Oriel College buildings because of the statue of Cecil Rhodes. The university, uh, the college decided to keep the statue of Rhodes, who was a major financial benefactor to the college. And Rhodes was, of course, the one who made Rhodesia and was the great South African magnate. And there was a move to get rid of statues of Rhodes because he wasn't nice to the natives. Uh, well, he wasn't nice to anybody, let alone natives. And Oriole said, no, thank you. We'd rather have the money and keep the statue than uh, allow whiny kids to tell us what to do. And so the windy kids who now are a little bit older, who are lecturers, have said, well, we're not teaching at Oriel now. So how does an American student show up at an English uh, college and decide that the best way forward is to take down the portrait of the queen? Well, this is another uh, result of critical race theory, which, if you don't know this, it's not new in American schools. Kids have been brought up for this, at least I can trace back maybe eight years, where this has been slowly introduced uh, a little bit at a time into the public education system and pr uh, private education system here in America. This kid arrived in England knowing full well that 
he was by his race an oppressor he was caucasian he didn't have enough melanin to be an oppressed and this is his way to express and make the news and stuff like that and be totally woke we always thought that the schools were just making social justice warriors they weren't that that was kind of some ruse that we're just looking for oh they're just into climate change or they're just into this and they're just into that no, I think the ultimate goal always was critical race theory to make sure that we've created two sets of individuals, the oppressed and the oppressor. I, by the nature of my skin, low melanin, am an oppressor. George, you are too, in case you didn't know this. People of color are the oppressed. And I think we're finally seeing this play out to the desire of critical race theory where those who think they're oppressed are fighting back against the oppressor. A great example is the uh, Amazon driver this week who attacked a customer of Amazon who was <laughs> receiving a package and beat her and said, you need to check your white privilege. White privilege is a, obviously uh, a moniker and definition that comes from critical race theory. And he was expressing that, you know, I feel oppressed and I'm going to express that to you. I think that's the ultimate desire of critical race series to divide and make sure that the West falls by dividing us into, into two separate uh, natures, George. It's hard to watch. Yeah, and it's going to become violent. Mm -hmm. um, a group of French army officers, generals, released a public letter about, oh, I think it was last month, about the separation of self-separation and segregation of Muslims in French society, where the Ben Lus, these Muslim neighborhoods, are no-go areas for uh, for Frenchmen who are not of, of Muslim or Arab descent, and they warned that this is going to lead to an open civil war because those places are not policed, they're not governable, they're just almost they're foreign entities on French soil. And what was surprising was that French junior officers who are currently serving in the military released a public letter supporting them, warning that they need the next war will be a civil war in France. Mm -hmm. We now uh, we have no go areas in Britain. Uh, there are parts of uh, Bradford, and uh, for instance, that you know, you, you, if you're a uh, uh, a white Englishman, a native Englishman, you just don't go in it at certain times of day and night. This uh, will get worse before it gets better, uh, but the if we continue down the path that we're going, where the elites, the governments, the church, this media, deny that there is a problem, while at the same time we have organized uh, rape gangs in Britain predominantly of Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin that basically victimize young British girls, take advantage of them, sexually abuse them. At a certain point, there's going to be a response, as Kevin pointed out, and that response will be violent. Now, in America, I just saw Portland and Seattle put a full stop to what was happening. The prosecutor from uh, Seattle said, I'm going to prosecute Antifa mm -hmm. He's, this week. He said, enough of this. Uh, we've lost control of our streets. It's time to use the Department of Justice and the justice system to stop this. Something they promised the whole time would not work. We can't, we're, we're not going to prosecute these people. They're just expressing anger. The, they'll soon, they'll just give up. If you ignore it, it'll go away. You know, critical race theory, Antifa, the, this problem we have, if you ignore it, will go away. That didn't happen. It didn't go away. They even got the president they wanted and it didn't go away. The violence doesn't stop because violence is what feeds them. It, it, it's how, you know, they get their reward. It's how they uh, get rid of that angst they have in their system it, is to fight the machine and fight the man and fight the government. It will never stop. And I think finally Seattle and uh, Portland are going to put a stop to it and, and start prosecuting these people and putting them in jail and not just letting them go out on bail. That is encouraging to me 
to see you know the liberal bastions of America understand finally that you have to finally do something. Yeah, the the elites in this country are following a path that Trotsky called perpetual revolution. They are angry that the working classes, the man of the people, the average African American, the average white working class person rejects what they're saying. That the average person in the United States wants to get ahead, wants to be some successful, they want, they want a better life for their children, they want the American dream. They don't want what is being peddled by them. And so the, the elites of this country, the news media, some, you know, the church, the government, uh, government bureaucracies, are basically saying, well, we're going to have to do this and sort of prime the pump and bring about that clash between blacks and white, between rich and poor. And we'll be above it in our gated communities and in certain places. But we want the clash to occur so that we will be able to achieve the political social ends that we desire. Now, what's happening is a tremendous backlash, if you will, um, I just, uh, well, within the church, for example, let me just stick to the church and not get into politics too far. If you look across the mainstream denominations, uh, the traditional ones, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, L Lutherans, Methodists, they're all collapsing, except for those who follow an orthodox theological position. They're the ones with kids attending. They're the ones with growth and dynamism. Um, my church is in a depressed area. It's the third poorest county in Florida, uh, where, the, where the income average is like 23,000. That's not a lot. Yet, we're the fastest growing Episcopal church in the state of Florida. It's not because I'm some dynamic whiz kid, Kevin, and our viewers over the years know that's not true. Mrs. Conger would add something here, yeah. But rather, the gospel is preached, yeah. and we don't mess around. We don't get involved in politics. We talk about serving our neighbor, not supporting Proposition 1, 2, 3, stuff like that. We teach the Bible. We don't teach uh, race theory. I saw, I saw something in advertisement from A15, investing as po as social theology and i thought how tone deaf and clueless this is to have these seminars how to teach episcopalians how to use their money in good investments to provide for their retirement why by supporting woke corporations and this is a substitute for bible study this is a substitute for faith education to me, this is symptomatic, 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 and sim and a symbol of the death of the uh, liberal wing of the Episcopal Church. They're yeah. just not going to be around that long. No, and age is going to take them away. I, I was with some uh, Connecticut friends who were with us way back in the the days of the Connecticut Six and stuff like that, and we we're just looking at the the vastness of the emptiness of the Episcopal churches in Connecticut. All mm -hmm. these big churches were just colossal, large mega churches mm -hmm. in 1995 and 2000 you know, in decades before are virtually empty. They're, they've been made missional churches by the um, diocese because they can't support themselves. And so we have more non-self-supporting churches here in Connecticut in the Episcopal Diocese than we have supporting churches. And that's just getting worse and worse and worse. And on my bike ride, I'm not going to put all the pictures up, but when I bike ride here on the, the West Coast, East Coast, sorry. Yeah, East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Western side of the East Coast of uh, Connecticut, um, I go by all these churches. I went by St. Anne's and Antic, a giant church. But when you look at, and investigate it, there not a lot of people attend. There's another giant church up here in Norwich that just closed. There, you know, all these huge churches, and they they don't have anything to support them because 
in the end, they decided not to support the gospel and not to preach the gospel. They decided Absolutely to put the, right, the, Kevin. The, that rainbow flag of surrender on their front lawn. And that's all that's left now in front of the church is these ram, rainbow flags. Yeah. You're absolutely right that those who chase after the spirit of the age, when they catch it, they find that they've abandoned the gospel and they've not provided for the next generation. Yeah. It's, right. We've gone 37 minutes. We've got two or three stories left. It depends how you want it. You take it. We can't do all the stories. We can do anti-Semitism is everywhere, kind of an old story, but new now again. Harold the Great's new discovery, or um, Trump didn't do it. <laughs> well, let's, do, let's, let's just start and see where we go. Okay. okay. Um, today is Anne Frank's birthday. She was born on uh, June 11th, 1929, and Anne Frank, a famous Jewish girl, Jewish girl mm -hmm. wrote the diary of Anne Frank about her experiences of the Nazi occupation, and she eventually died in a concentration camp. And the only member of her family to survive was her father, and he took the decision to publish the diary. And I think every, uh, I know my children read it in school. I read it. Um, the, uh, I hate to say, but it, the situation that led to Anne Frank's dying in a concentration camp, we see arising again. Um, now, Jews are not being rounded up and gassed yet. And I hate to say that yet. But we are now entering a world where people who should know better are making excuses for murder and violence and anti-Semitism. We have the Archbishop of Cape Town, Tabo Makoba, who is a pretty, is, who's always been a political hack. In other words, he's always been in the pocket of the African National Congress. And really, well, I don't have high regard for his, his self. He wrote a letter about Israel, which we published essentially equating Judaism with Zionism and we should have a boycott of Israel, we should have an arms embargo, that Israel's an apartheid state, all the tropes that you hear the nut job saying. After uh, this latest uh, clash in Gaza, we had crowds going, th we had groups going through sections of Jewish communities in Britain, you know, ca calling out death to the Jews. Now that's not subtle, I mean, and in the United States, the United States, we're seeing uh, anti-Semitic incidents in New York and Los Angeles. We have now, a Minnesota state representative who is Congresswoman, Congresswoman, sorry, yeah, Ilan yeah. Omar, yeah. and there's another Congresswoman from uh, Detroit, and and our new government, the new administration, has decided that the best course is to throw money at the Palestinians. And hopefully we can buy them off. Well, they're buying stuff, all right, and those are called missiles from Iran. And the Melanie Phillips, who is a uh, syndicated columnist based in the UK, is basically starting to talk like American Jews. You need to think about moving to Israel, where you'll be safe. That, to me, is an appalling sign of the times. Anti-Semitism, for me, is that line when i see it arising i know uh, we're in major trouble that's the when they first come for the jews um i forget who said this it wasn't bonhoeffer but it was somebody else you know first they came for the jews i wasn't a jew then they came for the communists i wasn't a communist then the social trade unionists i wasn't trade unionists then they came for me um that is how it works and we're now finding the woke stirs in the church and media are picking up the anti-semitic tropes of uh, anti anti-zionism means hating jews and judaism and that the was jewish from people luther lutheran pastor martin neimuller well, yeah you're right martin neimuller I, I should have known that that's right no 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 i i had to google it thank you google for saving the show um, but if we, I guess my point is that if we don't recognize it and act now, and if we don't attack it in the church itself when it's spreading, uh, it takes many forms of this BDS, uh, boycott, divestment of Israel, which the U.S. government has labeled uh, anti-Semitic official policy of the U.S. government. Not that may have changed with the new administration. But when the church and academia and the media and banks 
all jump on a beating up the Jews, friends, we're in big trouble as a society. History repeats itself, and this time they won't stop at the Jews. Critical race theory will make sure that they stop uh, after they take care of all the people who lack the melanin to defend themselves. Uh, and George. What, I, what I would ask, we one of the, th I don't know if this is true or not. Uh, I read it in a book uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, The Banality of the Evil. And when the Nazis, the Nazis, when they invaded, conquered European countries, they required Jews to wear a yellow star. And uh, Hannah Arendt, in her book, The Banality of Evil, the story of the Eichmann trial, Adolf Eichmann, who was in charge of essentially the administration of the Holocaust. In Denmark, uh, Denmark had a limited form of self-government where the Nazis were at the top and they used the Danish administrators to run the country. Correct. It was said, we're going to require all the Danish Jews to wear a yellow star. And they went to the king, and the king said, well, no, this is wrong. And if you're going to do it, I will also wear a yellow star, too. Um, we need more King Christians in this world, people who will stand with the oppressed in a real positive way, not just make uh, virtuous noises just to be seen to be doing the good, but who will actually do the good and stand with the oppressed, stand with the Jews against the evil that is out, out there. We, well, we've arrived at an evil time where everything is with, without definition or has been redefined, and critical race theory has done a wonderful job in doing that. Racism isn't what it used to be, the definition of racism. Oppression and those who are oppressed is not the definition that it used to be. It's a whole new definition. It has to do with melanin. Uh, the oppressor, the master, is a completely different definition than it used to be. It's now a person with a lack of melanin. And privilege is a whole different definition. And, and now there's a new word called whiteness. And you just, you, you sit here and how do you deal with the new definitions? Well, first of all, you don't accept those definitions. Never accept the definitions of those people who are, are, are spouting wicked wokeism. You have to sit down and say, no, this is how we define racism. This is how we, we define oppression. This is how we define the oppressed. Oh, and by the way, let me tell you how we define salvation, grace, mercy, love your neighbor, and love your enemy. The, yeah. If we translate some of the woke terminology and worldviews into their German equivalent, we immediately pick up the parallels we're mm -hmm. talking kevin and i are untermensch we're subhumans That's right. we're not we're not the chosen we're not uh we're not the perfect race the master race um and this is this is what is being taught by critical race theory it's a circular logic you're bl uh you're black you don't understand you're not black therefore you can't understand um therefore all the arguments that you sort of point out as to why this is untrue it's because you're not black you can't understand why it's not true well what about people like candace owen and you know the uh, thomas soul and what these? about the hundreds of thousands millions of successful black people in america do they understand oh, and, yeah. and, you know and and or uh, the supreme court justice uh, clarence thomas or mm -hmm. senator scott from south, south carolina mm -hmm. how come they reject it well they're just token they're just pawns. They're just tokens. They're not really black. They're Oreos. Well, no, they're they're also racist. They don't know. Yes, it. they're racist. Yeah, but anybody who does not believe whites are racist, they are racist. You know, and it, uh, here it's a, it's a circular logic that keeps going, as well as fallacies that that keeps going around. Um, we had slavery in this country, so all whites are racist. Well, that's the circular logical fallacy. Mm -hmm. You know that that's no that that doesn't work that way. You you can't get yourself out of that logic chain. So yes, we had slavery in this country. It will be a forever scar in this country. We need to study it, learn from it, and never repeat it. Not hide it and try to uh, shame the the fifth generation after it. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And so, and it also teaches of a tremendous ignorance, ignorance of American history. 
Um, I'm world, a Yankee. World I'm, history. World history. World history, American mm-hmm. history. I'm a Yankee. Uh, even though I've lived most of my life in Florida, um, my ancestors fought for the Union. And many of them were Quakers who gave up their faith of nonviolence for a higher calling to preserve the Union and to stamp out the evil of slavery. Mm-hmm. And after the war, they became Episcopalians because they weren't invited back to the Quaker meeting house. But the but the the sacrifice that people are now calling for in the form of financial reparations was made by the shed blood of several hundred thousand soldiers on both sides of the civil war the penalty the payment has been exacted and america is not perfect but it is the only country of which i'm aware that has been able to weather these storms up until the present moment yeah, up until crazy well one of the things they like to blame for slavery and race current racism is blamed on capitalism Okay, you want to keep the black people down so you whiteies can wake, make more money. That's I've I've heard this now six or seven times in the last two or three days. I'm like, oh boy, we need to have a world history knowledge event. And then my daughter the other day said, well, Dad, American slavery is because of, because of capitalism. Because America is capitalism. And I had to take a moment and explain world history and go back that, you know, since the beginning of human history, when we had uh, feudal warlords and we had monarchies and we had, uh, you know, all this chaos going around, every nation, tribe, people group, color of skin, either were slaves or masters at one time or another. People have enslaved their own peoples. People have enslaved other nations. People have enslaved other races. And the, hold on. And so we finally get up until when capitalism was fully formed in America, 1824, 1825. When capitalism was fully formed as an idea here in America, it took us 40 years to figure out, oh my God, the South is abusing labor, and the North will never be able to compete with that. We need to go to war over this. Slavery became wrong, wrong not just religiously, but economically. And every, we understood through capitalism how wrong, beyond spiritually, slavery was. And we said, forget it. We're, you know, This is what finally got the North to, to, to commit troops who were on the border. Yeah, it's wrong, but we're not going to fight for it. Well, they were ready to fight for it. It wasn't capitalism the cause. It was capitalism who finally figured out that th- it's so unfair. It is so unfair. It, Spiritually, it, we figured out how evil it was. The people who propound these historical theories essentially are buffoons. They're ignorant of history. They're ignorant of what has gone before. And they've only been given a very, very tiny slice of knowledge. You know, slavery was part of the English world up until the Black Death. About 10% of English people were slaves, and the great majority were feudal peasants. Well, the Mm -hmm. Black Death so decimated the population that wages rose because there weren't slaves to do work. They'd all died. Russians were essentially serfs or slaves bound to their farms up until the 1860s. There are slaves today in Mauritania. There are slave markets in Libya today. You can go to uh, Tripoli and um, some of the coastal port cities and just just Google this. Look on YouTube and like German TV and the other TV series have done these things about the the slave markets have returned to North Africa. Libya is a failed state and they take these men and women captured. Anglican Inc., we reported the other day that... uh, uh, Islamists a- attacked a Congolese village, killed 50 people in the at local Anglican priest, and they carried off others. What do they uh, do with the others? They sell them into slavery. Now tell me what this has got to do with capitalism and what this has got to do with race. Oh, well, I can't. We can't yeah, well, do that. Uh, no, we can't. I mean, uh, for whatever reason, 
critical race theory is a uh, a twenty year study of <laughs> cultural Marxism and a twenty year study of American history. Uh, the the twenty years they study are probably eighteen twenty to eighteen forty five, and that that's how they they make their oppressor uh, oppressed argument. We'll talk about this more some other time. Uh, if you ever want a great a good book about cultural Marxism. Uh, that helps you understand it. I recommend Fault Lines by uh, Vodi uh, Balcom. Uh, great book. I've now read it twice. Does not make me an expert because I don't have a voice in this. I am of the low melanin oppressor variety, not the oppressed. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I am George Conger. And today, you know, is June 11th, but it is also episode 668 of Anglican unscripted.